I am Baymax. I am scanning your interrogatives. We're going to have to work together. Hi, my name is Chris Atkinson. Chris is a professor at the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. Today I'll be breaking down clips from movies and TV about artificial intelligence and robotics again. Autonomous decision making for the classic movie 2001, A Space Odyssey. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. So 2001 is a classic robot movie for a couple reasons. It was just way, way ahead of its time. For example, it made clear that a robot doesn't have to have a human-like body. It can be anywhere. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. Some people, when listening to Hal, think he actually has feelings. He's gloating a little bit about he's outfoxed the humans. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me. And I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. He may well have been programmed with emotions. That makes him a much better helper to the humans. Everything we say has some expression, some emotional content. Working with a robot would be incredibly boring if it was just this monotone. This conversation can serve no purpose anymore. Goodbye. Al? Al? This movie in the book before it made clear, it's not that the robot hates us. The robot was given a mission, and it figured out that the humans were going to interfere with the mission. This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me, and I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. In order to achieve the mission, the humans had to go. And this is a story that we see over and over again in talking about robots. Decision-making, Star Wars. Where do you think you're going? Well, I'm not going that way. It's much too rocky. This way is much easier. What makes you think there are settlements over there? The charm of Star Wars robots is that they were all quirky and had personalities, and it was fun to watch them. Unfortunately, reality is a lot more boring. What are you talking about? Robots, first of all, wouldn't use sound to talk to each other. So you'd have two robots standing there and there'd be nothing to see. I've just about had enough of you. Instead, they just transfer what we call a utility function. Don't get technical with me. Which is something that says how much are you willing to pay to get something. And if only humans could do this, we would solve a lot of conflicts. And don't let me catch you following me, begging for help, because you won't get it. Social robots, Silicon Valley. So you've just been out here all night talking to a robot? Fiona, would you excuse us for a second? Yes. What's been a huge surprise ever since the beginning of artificial intelligence is if you get an artificial intelligence and a human being one-on-one, -on -one, you basically can't stop the human from bonding with the robot. I know that Fiona is a man-made piece of digital equipment okay. powered by artificial intelligence, Good. but I don't remember ever having a conversation like the one I've been having with her over the last 12 hours. That was shown in a very early conversational agent in the 1960s, incredibly crude, called Eliza and People would sit there, they typed to it for hours. I, I told her that I was afraid of being found out as a fraud. Okay. And she told me that she's afraid of magnets. I love that line. Well, I'm shutting her down. Check it out. I'm a robot. <laughs> Ripping apart a body doesn't mean the same thing for a robot as it does for a human. You're not killing the robot. The robot brain could be in the cloud anywhere and could be connected to anybody. Wait, uh, hey, Garrett, uh, don't, don't go over there. Don't look in that. Oh, Fiona. You're just talking to a, a microphone and a speaker. Data collection, ex machina. This is where Ava was created. Sir. 
If you knew the trouble I had getting an AI to read and duplicate facial expressions. I would argue that it's sort of no tougher to do facial expressions than any of the other things. What's hard about facial expressions is getting the decent data. You sort of be, need to be in a studio like this to get a good shot of somebody's face. You know how I cracked it? Every cell phone, just about, has a microphone, camera, and a means to transmit data. So I turned on every microphone and camera across the entire f***ing planet. What is absolutely accurate and true today is if you want to build intelligence, currently the best way to do it is collect a lot of data. And I mean a lot of data, more is better, and use that to train something called neural networks, which are a sort of crude cartoonish model of how we used to think the brain worked. Here, we have her mind. The crystal ball part is science fiction. There's the weird thing about search engines. There's like, striking oil in a world that hadn't invented internal combustion. My competitors, they thought that search engines were a map of what people were thinking, but actually they were a map of how people were thinking. Most people are horrified to hear that somebody is recording data. But look, here's the deal. Letting people use your data, hopefully they anonymize it, is how we're gonna get useful servants. That's exactly right. Cooperation, Robot and Frank. Just bring me some cereal. That cereal is full of unhealthy ingredients. I threw it away. They sort of made an extreme version of, you know. That cereal is for children. Eat your vegetables. Enjoy this grapefruit. E eat this grapefruit. You're for children, stupid. In order to help people, you gotta make a bargain with them. What's the carrot? It can't just all be stick. Even humans taking care of other humans have the same problem. Frank, we're going to have to work together. You are a robot butler. I'm not a butler, Frank. I'm a healthcare aide, programmed to monitor and improve your physical and mental health. The big problem we're going to have in the future, where we're building all these things that are supposed to help us, you know, how should they behave? If all we're succeeding is automating nagging, nobody's going to like it. That thing is going to murder me in my sleep. Healthcare robot, Big Hero 6. This is what I've been working on. Hello, I am Baymax, your personal healthcare companion. I cried when I first saw that movie. A robotic nurse. Some of my own work helped in inspire Baymax. Hello. In order to get robots that are safe to take care of people, as a, uh, I wanted to make them very light. Looks like a walking marshmallow. No offense. We started looking at inflatable robots on the theory you can't kill someone with a pool toy. Going for a non-threatening, huggable kind of thing. The Disney folks visited our lab and really de developed it in ways we hadn't even thought of. And thus, we got a lot of inspiration from watching that movie. I will scan you now. Scan complete. You have a slight epidermal abrasion on your forearm. I suggest an antibacterial spray. What's in the spray specifically? The primary ingredient is bacitracin. It's a bummer. I'm actually allergic to that. You are not allergic to bacitracin. What we can't get scanned for is the internal chemistry, which it was sort of suggested that Baymax could scan you and tell you about something that was chemically wrong with you. You do have a mild allergy to peanuts. But that's within the realm of possibility and, you know, might happen in our lifetimes. What kind of battery does it use? Lithium ion. That's actually a little problematic. Yes, lithium ion batteries are really good to use, but they're also likely to explode or burn up. And there's this famous case of NASA, and they had a robot sitting in a lab. The robot suddenly starts burning and basically burns up entirely. So batteries are going to be a problem. You have been a good boy. Have a lollipop. We've seen in other movies that, you know, a robot that comes in there and just tells you what to do is gonna be met with a lot of resistance, hostility. It's just not gonna work. So this is my Baymax. It takes care of me. I take care of it. You know, it doesn't take much for a robot to be a good companion. Awakening, Avengers, Age of Ultron. You are Ultron. 
A global peacekeeping initiative designed by Mr. Stark. Mr. Stark. They're trying to show you a robot, what we'll call booting up, from not operating to fully operating. This feels weird. That's typically a complicated process uh, where you have a bunch of, of different modules or subroutines that turn on one after another. And if you don't get the sequence right, nothing works. I'm a peacekeeping program, Mr. Stark. I don't get it. That is too much. In this case, they tried to show you lots of lights and pictures and whatnot. The mission. Give me a second. Peace in our time. We turn the robot on. It starts thinking really fast. And within seconds, it's figured out. If I'm going to achieve peace in our time, I've got to get the humans under control. I've got to be the master of everything. I believe your intentions to be hostile. Conversational agents, her. We'd like to ask you a few basic questions before the operating system is initiated. This will help create an OS to best fit your needs. How would you describe your relationship with your mother? It's pretty stereotyped to ask a question about your mother in a psychological test. If I tell her something that's going on in my life, her reaction is usually about her. A psychological tests are really annoying and they made that one really annoying. <laughs> it's not about... Thank you. Please wait as your individualized operating system is initiated. Yes, the system doesn't have to hear your entire response to move on to the next question. A real psychological test typically involves a lot more questions. What do I call you? Do you have a name? Or... Um, yes. Samantha. Really? Where'd you get that name from? I gave it to myself, actually. When did you give it to yourself? Well, right when you asked me if I had a name, I thought, yeah, he's right, I do need a name. But I wanted to pick a good one, so I read a book called How to Name Your Baby, and out of 180,000 names, that's the one I like the best. I actually expect to see this level of dialogue about restricted subjects like your email to happen pretty soon because there's intense economic pressure for the folks at Amazon to get Alexa to do it. Do you want to know how I work? Yeah, actually. A lot of very smart people are working really hard on it, and I expect it to happen pretty soon. Wow. That's really weird. Personality. Wally. <laughs> A really interesting question in robotics is, should robots have a personality or emotion? or motivation. So far, we've been modeling our robots on Spock. Totally logical. <laughs> In terms of making them successful when they're on their own, it might be the case that we need to give them personalities, emotion, motivation in order to succeed. Wally's an interesting example of what we call an autonomous robot. In the movie, of course, he's all by himself and he has to figure out what's interesting. Wow. And I would argue that his personality could play a big role in figuring out what am I gonna put in my little trailer there and what am I gonna just leave on the ground? And he discovers this little uh, plant, which he treats with great respect. That personality is what guides Wally in making the big decisions, the decisions that matter. Consciousness, humans. I am a synthetic, but I'm awake, conscious. I really don't know what to do with consciousness. I certainly think I'm conscious, but I have no idea if any of you are conscious, and I have no real way of finding out. All right, whatever it is, I, I don't wanna know. From an engineering point of view, consciousness is not yet a really useful concept. So when I build robots, I, I, I never even think of consciousness. I can think, sense, feel, care. So a lot of people wonder, you know, can robots really feel? Can they get in love and all this stuff? And I guess I've been in this business long enough that from my point of view, if they act like they're in love, then they're in love. I can't tell if someone else loves me. I just have to go on whether they act like they love me. I like you more than anything I've ever seen or heard or touched. Now, we certainly can generate that speech that she gave towards the end. Everything normal is bigger and brighter when I'm with you. You make everything 
brighter when you're around. You make everything more. I think that that probably comes straight out of Hallmark. Targeting Chappie. By blowing that stuff up, he did two things. One, he gave the robot something else to shoot at or think about. We can't get a clear shot. Try to get the robots to attack somebody else, so even though they know you're there, they, you're not important enough. Figuring out if a soldier or a vehicle is on your side or an opponent is a hard problem. It's in fact a hard problem for current military systems. With airplanes and other vehicles, we put in electronic markers that, for example, respond to radar and send out a code that says, I'm on your side, and if they don't generate the right code, they're not on your side. I don't believe we do that on soldiers yet, but we could. So. This scene appears very complicated and hard to process. Partly because we're not used to acting this fast, but actual soldiers are trained for this kind of thing and are trained to process this very quickly. Robots would also be able to process it very quickly. If you sort of crank through all the possibilities, all the different ways how to detect humans, we probably could find a way to hide from the robots, but it isn't gonna be easy. Small talk from Star Trek. Captain? Bridge? I understand that our carrier has some very interesting weather patterns. Mr. Data, are you all right? Yes, sir. I am attempting to fill a silent moment with non-relevant conversation. Small talk. It's hard to tell the difference between a robot tuning its parameters or writing entirely new programs. One of the original programming languages, Lisp, was created so that robots could write programs for themselves. I've written a new subroutine for that purpose. But if we say tuning parameters is a form of writing your own programs, robots have been writing their own programs for a long time. If you really are interested in small talk, then you should keep your eye on Commander Hutchinson at the reception this afternoon. He's a master. Now, I want to hear about everything that happened after you left Starfleet Medical. If you essentially learn how to interact with people by watching people, you're going to pick up on their interactive styles and their all the things they do. A pleasure. The pleasure is mine. The original goal of robotics in the 60s, 70s, 80s was, robots ought to be able to figure it out for themselves. When we started trying to get robots to do what humans do, we realized what humans do isn't dictated by the laws of physics. I was aware of that. And the best way to figure out how to imitate humans is to directly imitate humans. <laughs> Smart Cars, Knight Rider. Kid, kid, you there? Where would I go? Knight Rider is another classic robot, in this case, TV show. It's really important, and it sort of guided a lot of thinking of what robots should be like. A little consideration would be a beginning. We can certainly have robots that have fancy lights on them. Looks like Darth Vader's bathroom. And we can certainly get cars to talk. Rave on, machine, rave on! We could build Kit today. <laughs> the difference between Kit and what we could build today is, Kit is what we call AI complete. It knows about everything. I am scanning your interrogatives quite satisfactorily. The car we built today would be expert on a very limited number of things. And I think it's much more realistic that we're gonna have robots that are pretty good at a limited number of things and gradually get better and better. I suppose so. Rather than we go instantaneously from, you know, toaster level intelligence to it's as good as a human. After all, we're only human, right? Conclusion. We watched a lot of clips, a lot of stuff that I saw 40 years ago. Folks in the studio here with me weren't even born yet. And I have to say it's made a huge difference to my life and, you know, helped me build robots. And I hope 
that watching this will get a lot of young people inspired to also build robots. It's tremendously creative, it's a lot of fun. Let's do it.